Hey, what's up, everybody? If you appreciate the format and you appreciate what we're doing here, then make sure you contribute to the Cash App. Make sure you contribute to the PayPal. The only time black men are allowed to speak is when it benefits others. So, hey, this is your opportunity to speak. I want to hear from you. And if you want to make this voice louder and clearer, then what you need to do is contribute to the Cash App, the PayPal, and the Super Chat. I appreciate you. Hey, what's up, everybody? If you appreciate the format and you appreciate what we're doing here, then make sure you contribute to the Cash App. Make sure you contribute to the PayPal. Make sure you donate to the Super Chat. It's only you and your contributions that keep this thing going. Thanks. Hey, what's up, you guys? This is Dennis Sperling, and I am back at you guys to get today with some more answers. And um, I truly hope that you are angry after this uh, presentation. I hope that you are challenged. I hope that it's disturbing to you. I hope that I cause for you to have to think or rethink all of the concepts uh, as to life and socialization. Uh, that you've been privy to. I hope that this also answers questions that you may have as to life in general and why things happen the way they do. Specifically today, we are going to talk about social hierarchy from the perspective of a biologist. Now, my first day of undergrad um, at Grambling State University, I was informed uh, that we had uh, certain definitions that we had to memorize, we had to internalize. One of those was the definition of biology. It's very simple, it's very straightforward. It is the uh, study of life and the process of life. That being the case, biologists, the good one, uh, at a certain point, you begin to have to experiment or understand psychology, sociology, and pretty much how the world operates. Now, the question for today is why women demand attention. And I'm telling you guys, it's a matter of life and death. Now you guys are like, what the hell is Dennis talking about? Here we go again with this craziness. This guy needs to stay in the lawyer lane. But again, my first love always uh, will be biology. And so it, it will remain that way. And so although I continue to practice law and I enjoy practicing law, I wanna make sure that uh, the scientist in me has always exercised his right to voice his thoughts, theories, and opinions. In the meantime, look, we got 47 people in the chat room. We got 43 likes. Make sure you guys hit the likes up. Shout out to my man, King J, new member. Shout out to Randall. Shout out to Volcanus, uh, JJ Diesel Cowboy Monk. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you guys. Please continue to contribute to the Super Chat, the Cash App, and the PayPal. And without further ado, we will go ahead and get this thing commenced. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the evolution of society. How did this happen? And I'm gonna go ahead and get this brief presentation in here. I'll break it up a little bit, we'll talk, and we'll be right back. Here we go. Bit about the evolution of society. For most of human history, 90% of human history, all human beings on the planet lived in a form of social organization that anthropologists call hunting and gathering tribes or foraging tribes. So this is, you know, from the from the inception of modern humans Fair use. Uh, uh, for 90% of human history. <clears throat> and hunting and gathering tribes generally consist of bands of around 100 to 150 people. When bands get up around 150 people, they tend to split. If they drop 
uh, they tend to consolidate. And in these bands, uh, everyone is connected through blood or marriage. The society is essentially a big extended family. It's a huge kin group. So think about that for a minute. An entire society uh, comprised of 100 to 150 people. In a typical day in Jacksonville, you will see more people than many, many hunter-gatherers would see in their entire lives. Uh, you know, just walking around campus, you'll see more people than most hunter-gatherers would see in their entire lives. All right, so what we're talking about here, folks, is how human beings came together and formed societies. This gentleman is a professor over in Florida, and he gave, put this, good, this really good presentation together, and I wanted this to be uh our introduction because you have to understand how we got to where we are we went from basically small groups of 150 people to having major mega cities that we have now but let's continue to listen uh most of uh, ancient people in hunting and gathering tribes never traveled more than 50 miles from the place where they were born and the reason why they call them hunting and gathering tribes or foraging tribes is pretty simple there were only two jobs the men hunt and the women gather every day uh, when people get up in the morning the men would go hunt for game and protein and the women would also tend the children and gather vegetable matter and fiber for everyone to eat uh, there was no cultivation of plants uh, or domestication of food animals of any kind uh, all right so what he's saying is basically this is before farming you had one job you woke up you men, you go out and shoot stuff or stick stuff, kill stuff. And you women, you go over there and gather food. Why? Because we're physically different. Because men are more apt to do what? Be able to go out and kill. And here's the, cra and, and here's the thing you got to understand. At this point, a woman who was able to gather as much food or uh, calories or whatever as a man, this was an egalitarian society because there was e equal work. Now, it wasn't until... Later on, when farming started, the men were able to do what? It was men were able to uh, say, hey, you know what? You can sit down. Matter of fact, you go somewhere and look pretty and be attractive to me. I got this farming thing down. We got enough resources for everybody. You'll see the change in society. That's when there was a need for equal rights and all that stuff. This is how we evolved. But go ahead and continue to listen. In other words, once life became convenient and comfortable, women were able to sit down. That same sitting down that they say they're commanded to do. In other words, you're making us sit down and stay home and take care of the kids. Well, before you had to go out and gather, you had to go out and bust your butt, be out there fighting them lions. A, 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 a wild zebra might come up and kick you in the back. But anyway, get the likes up, you guys, and uh, contribute to the super chat, the cash app, and the PayPal. Let's get back to it. So, what you are a basic nomadic tribe uh, ranging over a territory hunting for game uh, and gathering. Now, if you think about a tribe of 100, 150 people, imagine how much food that is that you have to come up with in a day to feed the tribe. Think about how many deer or antelope or how many rabbits or how many uh, you know wild hens you would need to collect in order to feed the tribe. And so the earth was very sparsely populated. There were humans, you know, in just about every corner of the earth, but it was very sparsely populated. And what would happen is a tribe would exhaust the resources in one part of their range, and then they would move to another part of their range. Um, and uh, these nomadic tribes had no uh, private property of any kind. Uh, now, if you think about it, you know, imagine you're going on a lifelong camping trip everything you own, you have to carry on you. You're only gonna take what you need. There's virtually no um, technology. All there is is you know, maybe a bow and arrow and um, a satchel and some moccasins and a bladder that holds some water. And that's really all you've got. At night, you make a lean-to uh, under the trees and sleep in it, and that's it. There's no private property because there's nothing to own. There's no control over the environment besides basic food and shelter. All right. What does that There's mean? There's no written language of any kind. There's no control over the environment other than food and shelter. In other words, you don't have any control over the environment. The only thing you can do is do what? You can hide yourself under some cover. 
uh, or you can go get gather food or hunt for food. When he says control over the environment, that's science talking that there was no farming or anything like that. That's what he said. At some point, we began to have control over the environment where we live, not the environment like the air and how much it's going to rain. That's what he's talking about. Uh, let's continue. Mind. Uh, hunting and gathering bands have been around for over 100,000 years, but writing is only about Hunting gathering ba bands have been around for over a hundred thousand years. Now look, I want I know you Bible thumpers are gonna get angry with me. So bring your Bibles, because I know this is not written in I understand you're mad, but let's listen to a little science for a little while. Okay. You saying folks that are afraid of COVID-19, you're not denying that. You, well, some of you are denying that science, but for the most part, we're gonna adhere to science today. All right, we'll have Sunday, we'll talk about the Bible, but I, I know you're angry. I know you get because this is not in your Genesis chapter. But we're gonna continue. About five thousand years old. So all of written language is about five thousand years old. That's what this gentleman said. The culture, all of the norms of the society are passed on through oral tradition. Uh, there was no, you know, if you think about the way that we control our population and control the environment, there was no such thing as birth control. Um, they reproduced to meet the level of their resources, uh, although they weren't as fertile as modern. <clears throat> what does that mean? They reproduce to reach the level of their resources. The reason that after the industrial age, uh, we began to basically breed, breed, breed. We're at 8 million now. They say by the end of this century, there will be over 12 billion people on this planet. That's more people that have, than have ever existed on the planet Earth ever. OK, why? Because we have resources, we have comfort. All right, what he's also going to go into is explain to you how dangerous childbirth was at during these times where there's no medicine, no painkiller or, or, or those sort of things. So let's continue to listen. Humans are because uh, it was a very difficult life and uh, people had a hard time getting uh, enough calories to sustain themselves. And we know that um, in order for women to achieve menarche or to to have a normal cycle, they have to have a certain amount of body fat. And in our society, it's easy to get that much body fat. You have to prevent <clears throat> acquiring too much. It is a biological necessity for women to have a certain amount of body fat in order for them to even have a menstrual cycle. That is why when women begin to exercise, especially pro professional athletes who train every day, when they lose that level of body fat, what happens? Their, uh, their, menstrual strike, their menstrual cycle goes haywire. And so because of that, they're unable to have children for a lot or, or it's a difficulty. So, but now in the society that we live in, obesity is the problem. You gotta fight to, to, to not consume so many calories. There's calories everywhere, McDonald's, Burger King, the, the, the corner store, you can Uber Eats. So this is what they're, but at, but at that time they had to fight just to eat. So women didn't have children because there wasn't enough food. It's a biological shutoff valve. You don't have enough food, you don't have enough body fat, you won't get pregnant. This is how humans regulated their own uh, population. Much body fat in our society, but in their society, hunting and gathering societies, it was difficult to uh, acquire enough calories to have enough surplus to actually reproduce. Uh, and for this reason, infant mortality rates were extremely high. Um, half of all people, half of all children in hunting and gathering tribes would die before they made it to adulthood. And part of that is that just how tough life is. And the other is that there was no medical technology. I mean, ask yourself, you know, what kind of shape you'd be in if it wasn't for medical technology. I mean, how many of you listening to me would be dead right now without modern medicine? Have you had your appendix out? Uh, that's a routine operation in our society, but it was 100% fatal for a hunter-gatherer. Um, did you have your wisdom teeth impacted? There was no dental surgery. Uh, you, you, in a hunting and gathering society, those wisdom teeth would get uh, infected and you would die. When I was 25 years old, I broke my femur. Uh, and I was in the hospital for a while and they had to do some surgery, but they eventually repaired my femur. Well, you know. We're going to slide past this for a minute. He's just blabbing. Let's go ahead and get to this part. Human environments are artificial. And if we're not living in a hunter-gathering environment, we are essentially fish 
out of water. Right. Um, what he basically said is that the environment that we're living in now, our homes, our cities, these are artificial. We are now able to control the environment. And so because of that, our biology has not quite caught up to our society, socialization, so to speak, to the societal norms that we have now. That's basically what he said. Uh, and uh, let me give you some uh, examples of this, right? I mean, uh, our uh, societies have evolved much faster than our bodies have been able to evolve. Make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you the like button as soon as you come in. We got 112 people in the chat room. We're answering some serious questions today that are going to help you guys. Anybody, whether you're a pickup artist, MGTOW, blue pill, red pill, when I get through with this, whether you are pro-black, whatever you are, you're going to understand a lot more about life than you do at this point. Just keep listening. And so even though you live in a modern society, you still have a hunter-gatherer brain. And many of the modern problems that we face <clears throat> in our society are because we are biological hunter-gatherers in a sort of artificial technological society. Listen. So think about, um, you know, what is ADHD? All right. So you guys listen to this. ADHD. We come, we talk, that's the attention deficit syndrome. This is not a problem in a hunter-gatherer society. Why? Because you're not, you don't have to sit still for six hours as a kid and read something all day. Obesity is not a problem in a hunter-gatherer society because you're not sitting around eating everything that, that crosses your plate. You got stuff to do. All right. So, so he's he's going to explain that a little further. Attention part. deficit hyperactive disorder, a very common malady. There's not a classroom in America that doesn't have a kid that struggles with ADHD, um, and this is the inability to concentrate for a long period of time or to remain focused on a particular topic in a hunting and gathering tribe where you are you know get, you're foraging and looking for game adhd would not be a problem it would be a personality style it's not that the genes that cause adhd or the type of thinking that is is found among people with ADHD didn't exist. It has always existed. It's just only a problem in modern society. ADHD becomes a problem when, uh, instead of having children uh, you know, follow their parents into the field, um, we ask children to sit still for six hours a day in a desk and you know, put their nose in a book. Like You're not evolved for that. You're not designed to do that. And that's why some people have a problem doing it. Or think about dyslexia. Dyslexia, okay. the prefix dys, means. So we get uh, that point, right? He's just basically saying some of this social stuff anxiety dealing. disorder. I often right. ask my students, how many of you would be nervous if you had to stand up in front of a class and give a lecture, or if you had to give a speech? Well, there is no social anxiety disorder when you know everyone personally. All right, so we're getting that. Basically, he's saying we, he's proving the point that we are still a hunter gatherer society i eat in our mentality and in our physiology we're not quite accustomed to this highly technical technical society with all these conveniences our bodies haven't adjusted that's basically what it said let's let's go for it was on but it was about these people that have a form of ocd that caused right. them to hoard things in fact the show was called hoarders where right hoarding obesity none of this is a problem to, uh, of hunter gatherers rid of how could there be hoarding when there's no right. private property? Right? Okay. Or I mentioned earlier the obesity epidemic. Right. We talked about For that. For ninety percent of human. Uh, he's going to say. I mentioned thing. earlier the obesity epidemic. For ninety percent of human history, <clears throat> the problem has been not being able to get enough cow. Right. We haven't been able to get enough. Food. And they're the kinds of things that you need um, when you are. Uh, a hunter gatherer. Let's listen. Okay. Based of sugar, because those things were uh, are calorie dense, and what he's basically telling you now is that the problem has been things like not being sugar, able to get enough calories. Things like sugar that tastes good to you, things you desire, honey. 
these are things you sought after because they were high in, in, in calories. So your taste buds cause you to be attracted to sugar. Some of the things that you're attracted to now, like cheese and sugar and those things that they add in, in some of your foods to make you addicted to them, they do that because they understand your physiology and that you're a hunter gatherer and your body craves that because it's high in calories. You've been, this is how we evolve over a 10,000 year time period. So that's what he's saying there. And that is why you are biologically designed to love the taste of fatty foods and to love the taste of sugar because those things were, uh, are calorie dense and they're the kinds of things that you need um, when you are uh, a hunter gatherer. Well, that is why in an era of abundance where it's not difficult to get a hold of these things, we eat too much mm -hmm. because too much um, has never been an issue for 90% of human history. You're biologically engineered to eat that when you can get it. And uh, you're not designed to live in an environment where that is overly abundant. Uh, think about beauty standards. Now listen to this. What kind of expectations? Beauty standards. Do you think the hunter and gatherers had makeup? Did they have beauty standards? Let's keep listening, fellas. And this is, this is the crux of where we're going here expectation do you have for the physical appearance of your uh, significant other in a society of 150 people? Who do you think was the most attractive to the women? Who do you think the most mature males, the most masculine males, the males who looked like they were physically fit, the males who looked like they had been weathered? Where do you think this whole tall, dark, thing comes from tall dark and handsome let's continue to listen people yeah i imagine your expectations would be quite realistic whereas today you have people who are literally combing the world looking for the absolute most beautiful specimens so that they can hold those people up in front of all of us and show us what standards of beauty are and so you 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 can see why people have problems with body image or problems with the way that they look when they look perfectly fine um it's just that they're not absolute paragons of beauty right so uh these are uh the things that i am uh getting at that you uh <clears throat> all of these things exist because you're bucking your biology the uh biological organism can't adapt fast enough to keep up with the culture. We sort of live in a zoo that we have constructed for ourselves. And this is the kind of society that dominated human history. What I've done is uh, I put all, you know, from the, from the inception of modern humans, I've made a chart here uh, from the beginning of modern. Now look at this, the dominant economic form throughout history, uh, human history. 90% of the time that we've been homo sapiens sapiens, we've been hunters and gatherers. For about 10% of that time, which is about the past 5,000 years, we've had agriculture. For 0.3%, that's less than 1% of the time period during industrialization. This is when the vast majority of the people who now exist on this planet were born because life is very easy now modern anatomically modern humans to today you can see the blue slice 90 percent of human history uh hunting and gathering societies it wasn't uh until the last 10 percent of human history going back maybe we you get know, that, few, that few five take a look at some more stuff history that you have learned takes place in that little slice. The entire history of the United States essentially takes place, place in that little slice that constitutes 0.3% of human history. And that's why I'm saying that uh, we are not engineered to live in the kind of society that we live in, okay? So let's move on now from the hunting and gathering society to the agricultural society. Now listen to this. You get the likes up. In time, uh, humans were able to domesticate animals and plants, and uh, society transformed into one that had permanent dwellings. Instead Listen. of going out and gathering our food, we produce our food. And because we are producing our food on land, 
this allowed societies to get much larger and led to the birth of the first state level societies. So what he's saying is we went from having groups of it no more than 150 people. And at a certain point, when it was more than 150 people, groups would break off and go get their own group. But at the point where we were able to use land to create food, then the groups went from 150 to ranging in the thousands. This is how we get cities and city states, because the more people you have, the more organization is necessary for that society. And here's the other thing. Now, no longer are you related to that 150 people. Now you got people who are from other places. Now you got people who are foreign as far as DNA is concerned. So societies begin to form, languages begin to form, cultures begin to form because you got enough people for that level of variety and belief systems. Continue to listen. Now, how exactly societies transformed from hunting and gathering to agriculture was a central question for the sociological theorists, early sociological theorists, but that is something that would be covered in a sociological theory class. And we, in my sociological theory class, we spend a lot of time talking about that. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, sociological theory is the class you should take. But basically what's happened is you've, you've sort of moved from, in plow agriculture, you've moved from uh, human labor to produce food to animal labor to produce food and uh, a team of oxen is infinite. So basically instead of you going out there hunting and shooting something and the women going out there gathering stuff for food, for calories, that's human labor. Now you got oxen doing the labor. They till in the ground, planting seeds, crops come up, you eat the food. So basically it's uh, ox, it's basically animal labor conducting the, the uh, being expended for the food infinitely more powerful than a human in terms of its, uh, uh, you know, just raw muscle. And, uh, you know, you can plant a field with a team of oxen a lot faster than you can plant a field with a crude um, hoe. And so you have a massive increase in food production. <clears throat> but one byproduct of this Listen. is social inequality. One byproduct. One byproduct of the ease by which we're able to now gather, in other words, technology, one broad byproduct is social inequality. Let's listen. This is where it comes from. In hunting and gathering bands, for instance, because there's no private property and because there's no surplus, there really is no class-based inequality. See, what he's saying is when we nobody owned anything and it was every man and woman for himself, you get out there, get what you can. Nobody owned the land. See, nobody, nobody was able to. Have, I got 10 oxen. You got none. I own this 20 acres of land. You own one acre of land. I can produce more food. I can do more. There's no class system. You see, there's no class system. So there's no inequality per se. It just is what it is. You know, every man for himself. So keep so basically technology, innovation, a byproduct that is going to be classism. OK, so this is what we're learning. These bands are considered to be egalitarian. They are people are essentially equal in rank. You're equal in rank, rank as long as you in, in the in the in the um, hunter gather society, you're as equal to the next man, just depending on how much food you can run out there and gather and bring in. Not only that, uh, a role oh, yeah, well, of anthropologists um, typically uh, 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 present is one that says that women's in societies, women's status relative to men's is highest when women contribute about as much to the economy as men do. This is saying that in those hunter gatherer societies, a woman's status relative to men. It's about as high as a man's, depending on how much she can bring in. In other words, the more she brings in, the higher her status. Now, what happens? And what happens when the chief source of food and calories is dependent on how much manual labor you can muster in the use of oxen and other things like that? 
Well, of course, what's going to happen is men are better equipped to do this physical labor. And so women's status is going to be reduced because there's less for them to do. So let's because they're just not capable of, of mustering that sort of physical exertion, that power, upper body strength. They're not built for it. They're saying basically that the systems that we have now, classism, um, um, uh, inequality as to women is based on the technology that we have. It's based on the ability now that, that things are being done uh, uh, by animals and, and, and now moving forward, machines. Let's continue to listen. So when a hunting and gathering in, tribe, machines hunting invented is by indispensable, men. you need that protein. But gathering is also indispensable. You need the vitamins and fiber. And so women's work is just as important as men's work. Mm -hmm. And so you see very little gender inequality in hunting and gathering tribes. They tend to be egalitarian on the basis of social class and egalitarian on the basis of gender because women are important contributors to the economy. But in agricultural society, what happens is women are displaced. Um, uh, it in is, agricultural society, women are displaced. Listen, is just a fundamental feature of the species that the average man is stronger than the average woman. And uh, the average man is better at pulling a plow behind a team of oxen than the average uh, woman. Uh, the uh, agriculture required a lot of brawn and a lot of upper body strength. And what this did was it moved it gave men sole um uh dominance over the economic sphere and relegated women to the domestic sphere it removed women from the economic realm and when that happened their status relative to men fell dramatically so what he's now saying is that once we went from hunter and gatherers to agricultural it wasn't much women could do other than stay home and watch these kids and have babies now there's some benefits to that. You don't have to be out there in the wilderness, you know, toiling and hunting, you know, you, otherwise you'd be out there plowing, plowing the fields just like the men were. OK, so this is this is where the chauvinism part came in. Uh, in agricultural societies, you see for the first time polygyny or polygamy, the, the, the practice of having more than one wife. Why would you need to have more than one wife? Because you have more resources than everybody else. You got 100,000 acres of land. You got. 15,000 oxen, you got people, you know, working for you, you're going to be able to have more wives than the guy who has nothing. And so this is, this was just a practical evolution of, uh, of, 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 of the conveniences associated with development, i.e. through agriculture. Technology basically brings about these things. For uh, rules about <clears throat> women as property. Uh, and some of those things are uh, still uh, legacies or vestiges of those things still exist in our society today. And we'll talk about those when we get to gender. But one byproduct of the domestication of plants and animals would be horrible uh, economic inequality. The next transition was one where we moved from animal labor to machine labor. And this is, of course, industrialization. And industrial. Are y'all all right? Hit the number one button if you're all right. I know y'all bored. Y'all did not come here for a biology lesson. Y'all came here for some red pill, blue pill, pill conflict. Some, some you can come back and say that dude is crazy. Hit the light, hit the number one button if you're still there. I know y'all probably like, what is that? I didn't, I'm tired. I don't want to do any more biology. Uh, it's going to get there in a minute. Hit the number one button. Let me know you're still interested in this conversation. I promise you there are some jewels in here. You just got to be patient. All right. Hit the number one button if you guys uh, uh, are here and you're ready to learn something and you're ready to pick up something new. Hit the number one button. I promise you, you guys are going to enjoy this. It's going to be a great lesson. Let's continue to listen. But hit the number one button if you appreciate what I'm doing here. Economies are built on manufacturing where we use factories and assembly lines to build things. And this was the dominant form uh, of economy throughout the 20th century. But in recent years, we have uh, moved away from industrialization. You'll notice in the United States that uh, you know, we don't do, our, you know, our manufacturing base has essentially moved to other countries where labor is cheaper. 
we don't really build a lot of things in the United States anymore. So if we're not an industrial economy and we are not based in manufacturing, what is it that Americans do? What is it that rich Western democracies do? Well, we live in uh, an information age or an information. We live in an information age. We are no longer hunter gatherers. We are no longer uh, an agrarian society. We aren't even in an industrial society for the most part. We've shipped all of our industrial stuff to China and everywhere else. We are now at a technological society, which requires a lot less physical exertion, physical ability, physical prowess. We are now at the point where we are damn near egalitarian again because of our technology. So now, as it was in a situation with the hunters and gatherers, Women are now able to do what? Keep up with men because it's technological. All you got to do is sit there and type on a computer. Matter of fact, some would argue that they're better suited for it. But that's another point we'll deal with later on if I can get to it. But let's continue to listen. Information-based economy. And in an information-based economy, productivity is based on specialized knowledge, the manipulation and the mastery of specialized knowledge. One of the reasons so many of you are in school uh, and will remain in school throughout most of your 20s if you go get a master's degree is because there are credentials and there is a body of knowledge that you need to master in order to get a good job in this economy. <clears throat> in an agricultural economy, you can herd sheep when you're 15 years old. You're economically viable at age 15. In an industrial economy, once you're physically mature, you can work on the assembly line. There's not much you need to know to sort of turn a screwdriver or a, a, a work a press or something like that. But now to be an attorney or to be a physician or to be uh, an architect, there's a massive body of knowledge that you need to master. And that requires a lot of schooling. So, you know, strong backs are worth, are worth less. Strong backs are worth less. Who's typically associated with a strong back? Men are typically associated with a strong back. So, yes, we needed strong backs for hunting and gathering. We needed strong backs for the uh, agrarian societies. We needed strong backs for the uh, for the for for the industrialization uh, industrial societies. We don't necessarily need strong backs for techno. For, for this technological society that we're having in the first world. So what does that tell you as to what's happening to the role of men in the society? This is where we're, I, I promise you guys, and some of you guys who are, who are astute, you're already there. If you already know where I'm going, hit the number one button. And we're gonna get, we're gonna get back to this and we'll wrap this than up. They used to be, and big brains are worth more. And one of the things that you see, of course, in these information-based economies is that things even out with respect to gender equality. Things even out in respect to gender because you don't need a strong back to be productive and contribute to the economy in a technological society. Technology, by the way, that men invented. Let's continue to listen. Quality. Right. Things were fairly gender egalitarian um, in the hunting and gathering society because, remember the rule, women contributed about as much as men. And now the same is true in the information age. It is uh, certainly the case that a woman is the average woman is less able to pull a plow behind a team of oxen than the average man. But there's no difference in IQs between men and women. A woman can be a physician just as easily as a man. A woman can be an architect just as easily as a man. A woman can do, you know, in terms of these mental occupations, women women can do wow. them just as well as men. And that is why we see the rise and flourishing of feminism and uh, women's equality because because they don't need you anymore. They we've come full circle. So let's we're going back to a more egalitarian society because of the technology that men have invented. But let's continue uh, to watch. They are no longer relegated to the domestic sphere. They are now integral to the economy. So this is a very brief thumbnail. Okay, so here's the thing, fellas. I'm gonna slide back 
So basically, that was a summary of where we started and where we're going. Now, I'm going to put this here. This is a photograph of the point in man's history when we were in the hunter gathering phase. In other words, we operated in groups. Now, I know I'm going to make some of you mad with this next set. I understand that. I know. Whip your Bible out. Be angry. You know, hit me with all these Genesis chapter. Ver I got it. I know you're going to be angry. I get it. Man, you, I, I know. I know you're mad. You're mad. You're going to get even more angry in a minute. I want to draw a parallel between how human beings behaved in packs and how a uh, large mammalian, uh, large animals behave in packs. Okay. So what are we going to do? First, we're going to go, what's the first pack that we have here up? We have wolves. I want you to take a look together for safety. Remember that. The wolves will need to work as a team if they're to make a kill. Notice how this is kind of like a circle right there. You know that social circle that I'm always talking about? This is that social circle. Those who are outside of this social circle over here, they're more likely to become prey. They're more likely to be eliminated. The ones closer to the middle of the social circle, they have a higher social status. What are the, what do you think these are? The ones in the middle, the ones who are more likely to be, what, have higher, so probably the children, the, the offspring. In addition to that, those who are what? Who have higher social status amongst these animal, this animal group. Let's continue to listen. You're gonna learn. I'm gonna run that back. I want you guys to hear that. That's important. Okay, please listen. The bison form a defensive circle around their young, horns pointing outwards. The bison form a defensive circle around. Listen. What you have going on here is these elephants have formed up into a social circle and they're protecting the most vulnerable among them. Copy, thanks. Okay, they're protecting the, the baby Thank elephants. Did you copy that? It's That's what they're doing. Central That's They saw the wild dogs. Of the they jungle. formed up in that circle. Both they're protecting the baby elephants. All right, that's the point. I think I've driven that home. So here we go. Um, the question for today is, why is it that women demand attention? And I said it stated underneath there, it's a matter of life and death. I explained to you all the social circle and I gave you an explanation of the social circle. You see how society evolved. What did we come from? We came from a pack of, of human beings, no more than 150 deep. And just like these large animals, whether it be elephants, whether it be buffalo, uh, whether it, whether it be, um, uh, 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 what else did I have up there? A herd of wildebeest. You have a biological imperative, number one, to seek status because it gives you insulation from outside predators. It gives you a better opportunity to have food and higher quality of food. And number two, um, breeding rights. No different than what we have right now. Men who have higher social status, men who have um, who've battled longer and become the dominant male, i.e., it took the wildebeest eight years to become these dominant male, they get better food, they get more access to women, and they get more safety because they're they have a higher status. Now, as far as the social circle, who's in the middle of the social circle? Those that are most vulnerable. Okay, so what does that mean? Why is it, Dennis? Why is it, Mr. Sperling? And this is what I put attention seeking. Why is it so important for women to gain attention of other members of society? Because what happens to uh, what happens to people who don't get attention? What happens to the ones that are left on the outskirts? The wolves and the lions and the dogs are out there. For them. The uh, the um, and so because of that, it is a biological imperative. Remember. For 90% of the time that we've been on this planet, we've been hunters and gatherers. So women are having a fight for social status. They're having a fight to get men of higher social status. And this is ex exists amongst men. Why is that? Why is that? Why is it that 
our sisters are so angry with white women all the time. I mean, it's like that's their mortal enemy because in this society that we live in, under what we call white supremacy racism, white women have a higher social status. Why is it that darker skinned women oftentimes seem angry at light skinned women, even if they're from the same tribe, so to speak? Because there is something called light skinned supremacy. Lighter skinned women have a higher social status. I hope you're angry by now. I hope you're just so mad at me that you want to cuss at the screen. But this is how we evolve, right? Everything that we're dealing with now is an outcropping of, the, of who we are and who we were as human beings. Here's another one. What are signs of social status? Okay, what are signs that you have ample resources and you'll provide as a man? Well, let's look, let's number one, let's look at some of the signs of social status that we see women doing. One sign of social status, and what is social status? The ability to say I have abundance and resources that I'm well taken care of and I'm well provided for. That increases their social status along with the color scheme, okay? Those handbags, those Birkin bags that cost $20,000, those Louis bags of, that's three or $4,000. That is a sign that I have ample resources to the point that I'm well taken care of, okay? How do you court attention in the modern society? Instagram. And what does attention do? Attention means that attention means that all eyes are on you. You're well taken care of because people are looking at you. You're in the middle of the social circle. All right. Here's another one I got for you. Why is it that we feel? Why is it that these animals com feel compelled to protect the more vulnerable among them? Why is it that they feel compelled to protect what? The young. Because the young invariably are weaker and they're defenseless. And this is one of our biological imperatives to protect the weaker among us. So what does that mean? Well, if you're not young, how do you go about appearing young? So that you will, uh, so that you will invoke people's protection uh, of you. Okay, what, what is, have you, you guys have heard the old statement uh, a damsel in distress. What is a damsel in distress? It's a human woman, a human being, a female who is in distress. What does that do? It brings out that biological imperative amongst us, right? That wants to protect them. Why do women cry? Women cry because that makes people around them say, oh, she's vulnerable. She's been emotionally uh, traumatized. Something bad is it. Everybody wants to come pay attention to her now that they're paying attention to her. She's she's protected by the crowd. The, 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 the group has surrounded her. The social circle. She's in the center of the social circle. Now, here's another one for you guys. We always wonder, why is it that these women put on all this makeup? Why do they do that? And this kind of relates to the to 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 the uh, to the the imperative we have to protect the young. Why is it that women put on all this makeup? What does makeup do? It makes them look what? Older? No. Makes them look younger. And what does that do? It invokes, it, it, well, there's a term called neoteny. And what it means is defined as the retention of juvenile features in adult, mammal, in, in adult mammals. And the reason that this is important, because what it does is it creates, uh, it, it draws upon our biological imperative to protect and defend the young. She looks younger and therefore what? She looks like she's more vulnerable in more need of, in our need of help. Have you ever been talking to somebody like talking to a child or even an adult and they will change their voice from talking like a grown up to talking like a child? For instance, if you let's say you're talking to your child and you got a little girl because little girls do this all the time. Hey, daddy, I need this, that, and the other. Oh, daddy, please give me this, blah, blah. They start sounding like a child. What is that? What are they doing? They are they are showing you that they are a child. Grown women can do it. There are some grown men that do it. I'm sure women find that, you know, obnoxious <laughs> because it flies in the face of what they're looking for, i.e. a masculine man who is fully developed, who is able to do what? Protect and provide, not a child. But what it does is, family, what it does is, is it invokes that biological impulse you have to protect the child. Let's do an experiment real quick. Right. And uh, I hope you guys are pissed off by now. Shout out to the Roger Report. Thank you so much for the contribution. And, you know, look, I know. Hey, look, man, 
it is what it is. You want you want the answers? I'm gonna give you the answers. There's no quick, there's no quick fix to this. You know, either you gonna get it, and you're gonna like it, or you're not gonna like it. But whatever, man, you're gonna get it, man. So let, let's take a look at this. I want you guys to check this out, right? So I, I took the time to pull up some photographs that I want to share with you guys. Oh my god, look at that. That's terrible. All right, tell me. Uh, hopefully it'll pull up. I'm sorry if it doesn't. Man, it's taking a while. Hold on a minute. Let me see. Let me see if I can put them over here for you guys. All right. Give me one second. Uh, I want you guys to tell me why these photographs of these children are ugly. Because this is what this is called. All I did was Google ugly baby. Why Why is the photograph of this child ugly? This one right here. Most of you will probably say, well, it's because of the size of that nose. Some of these pictures are fake, of course. But it's the size of that nose. You guys are saying that nose is too big for that baby. Let's look at another. And here's this is a, this is a comic rendition. But the bottom line is... The reason you guys are saying this is an ugly baby is because it looks like a grown man, which drives home the point because of the features. The features are big. The features are ugly. The features look like a mature man. This does not look like a baby. This does not look like a baby. This looks like a grown man, right? Uh, this one with all wrinkly and stuff. And I'm not asking for opinions. I'm asking for general takes. Why is it that these children are ugly? Why is it that this little baby is because he looks Wrinkled up, he looks like an old man right here. That's why this guy with the long, this kid with the long face, he looks like a, a, a grown man, right? That's why. Now, by contrast, I want you to look at uh, these pictures of these babies. Okay, why are these babies deemed cute and pretty? Because look at their features no wrinkles, they got little small noses, big pretty eyes. Uh, clear faces, no wrinkles. This is neoteny. We're drawn to these children and we're drawn to want to protect them because they look, look how they look, look how they look. They're cute, small features, not a lot of wrinkles. Now, this is a picture of, and so, and that's why we're drawn to protect them. Here are some pictures of some newborn babies, right? What do they look like? Now, I want to particularly show you guys these little black babies right here. Now, everybody knows most little black babies come out of their mommies and their hair looks like this. It's long and pretty and slick down. Even this little baby right here looks like he, he's about a month or two old, maybe a month. But about, yeah, that's about two month old, baby. Maybe three, his eyes are wide open. Uh, look at this little black baby. And you can tell by his ears what his color is going to be. But as it is right now, he's lighter. He's pretty or handsome, you know. Um, Look at this pretty baby right here. Now, this is a black baby. And you know this is not the typical phenotypical hair type of black children. But you see how it came out curly and soft, right? Here's another little black baby. And most people, if you have black children, this is how black children come out with the little soft, cute little hair, pretty little faces. Even if they're going to have a, a typical sub-Saharan African nose, it's still small and cute at this time, right? Another little black baby. Look at their ears. Look how soft their hair is. Look at this little black baby right here. Soft. They, it, they're pretty. We acknowledge because of the hair and, and because even it's a lot lighter than it's going to be when it gets when this baby gets older. But we like that. We're attracted to that. This is attractive to us, right? This is what we say. This is this is how we were developed, right? Anybody? You guys want to take a jab at this yet? Huh? Anybody angry yet? Because now I'm going to say some stuff that really pisses you off. The reason that we're attracted to these babies is because they're small, they're light, they got this cute hair. You see, even if they're black babies, this is why we're attracted to them. Because they seem more neotenous. They, they, they have that appeal about them. In effect, let's look at the opposite. When we talk about tall, dark, and handsome, Typically, we are talking about what? We're talking about this, right? Isn't that what they say? Tall, dark, and handsome, right? Why is it that, that women are attracted to men who are tall, dark, and handsome? 
what happens after you've been working in the fields all day? The sun hits you, right? What happens if, if, you're, if you're tall, dark, and handsome? That means you're strong, you're big. This is what this means. That's why the epitome of masculinity is typically dark-skinned men. We never say stuff like uh, uh, dark-skinned black. We, you don't see, let me, let me show you something. Let me, let me show you something. I, I want y'all to see something. <laughs> I want y'all to see something. When you think of masculinity, you don't think of Prince. Okay, you don't think of Prince at all. Okay, that's just not that's not who you think about. You do not think of Prince, do you? Because he's short, he's light skinned, and he's he look he's effeminate looking. He got the little soft features with the big eyes and whatnot. That is not what you think of when you think of masculinity, okay? It's just not, okay? So what is that telling you guys? It's telling you that dark-skinned men, as we have evolved, do what? They epitomize, they epitomize masculinity in human beings. This is why probably we're such a threat. This, look at this. Look at these brothers with the... They got the, the sub-Saharan African noses and 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 their, their skin color and whatnot. You, when you you don't think, <laughs> as I said before, this is not what you think about when you think about masculinity. You think tall, dark, and handsome. This is what this is what masculinity looks like. And of course, there's variations of physical masculinity, but this is what you think about. Okay, this is this is masculinity. So now. Can we all, if, if you don't like it, if you're angry, that's fine. I don't care. But the bottom line is, why is it, and I'm going to ask you this question, why is it family? Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and bring some people in because I, I want to go ahead and get, I want to hear your verbal response when I piss you off. Uh, join the conversation. I'm enjoying this. Join the conversation. Please come on in. We got 176 people in the chat room. I'm, I don't want to take any breaks. I just want to bring everybody in here because I'm going to ask you some tough questions. And I hope y'all are very angry when I finish. Join the conversation. Uh, JJ uh, uh, Cowboy Monk said, very interesting. Well, the bottom line is, family, if you go into human evolution, the evolution, or not even evolution, just development, societal development, we have certain uh, likes and dislikes. We are more apt to be attracted to certain people and, and we're more likely to be uh, not attracted to other people. OK, period. Let's see. What's up? How you doing? How can I help? You? Introduce yourself. Uh, face facts. Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I can. I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you, man. I was just doing a troll check. Uh, okay. Anybody else who wants to join in? Come on in. The link is in the chat room. Make sure you click on the link. Come on in the chat room. I want to get you guys in here. I want to talk about this from this biological standpoint, and I hope you're mad. I need some Bible thumpers to come in here, bring your Genesis and all that. The link is in the chat room. Face facts. What do you think about this, this conversation? Are you familiar with the term neotony uh, before this uh, conversation that we're having? Yeah, I'm familiar with it. Okay. What are your thoughts on this? Because I want to ask you some questions. What are your thoughts on this presentation thus far? And where do you think I'm going with it? Um, I'm, I'm, what I think you're going is basically like the intimidation factor of the, the strong black man. Well, that's, you could go there with that. But for the most part, we're talking about why, how society evolved and why women want attention. But I also mentioned some other things in there. So if, if the epitome of masculinity is tall, dark, and ha handsome. What is the epitome of femininity? Light, dark, light, and docile. Hmm. I said light skinned and, do and docile. Light skinned with these features, like uh, you, the cute hair. You like those babies I showed you? Right. You, okay. You, you under, uh, okay. So here's the thing, man. And it, I know it's gonna be uncom. I want to get some more people in here to talk about it because. You know, sometimes like last night I had a guy on here and I was basically asking him some questions and he realized like, damn, he didn't want to answer anymore. OK, but the bottom line is there's a reason why we're attracted to certain people and we always have been. 
the people that came up with the term tall, dark, and handsome, those are those are European women that came up with that. They're the ones that say, I need a tall, a man who's tall, dark, and handsome. You see what I mean? And what is dark, what is what does that represent? When you have these this broad nose, you look like a man. You understand? When you have right. a small nose and lighter skin, you look more like you know a, a more feminine person. That's why we're you look vulnerable. You see, children are vulnerable. They, if you look at the elephants, who do we protect? We protect the children. Who do we protect? We protect the women who look vulnerable. We don't protect the women who look strong and masculine like they can protect themselves, do we? Do we? Not at all. So if you had a tall, dark, and handsome woman, would you be running out there to protect her? Probably not. <laughs> she got it. Hey, man. This, yeah. So, but but the other thing I want to ask you, what? Why do you? So now that you understand the stole, see, and I was trying to. It's a complicated subject, but women fight for social status because if it allow, it, it's one of their biological imperatives. Because what does it do? It ensures that their own survival, and it ensures the survival of their children. The higher the social status they have, the higher the social status their man has the more likely they are to survive. So in a society where we have a group of men who have a higher social status than another group of men, which group of men do you think these women will choose to be with? The men with the higher social status. So in a society where black men are, are lower on the social status than white men, who do you think the women in that society will choose to be with? The white men. And, and what happens to those women who 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 are forced to deal with the men who have lower social status, even though they want the men with the higher social status. What do you think they're going to be doing? They're going to be bright with a level of contempt. They're going to be. That's exactly right. Right. And so what happens to that society when those women, when society has developed to the point where women don't even need men anymore other than to provide sperm so they can reproduce. You, you, you go, let's say you go from egalitarian, a uh, hunter gatherer society where men and women, as long as you can pull your own weight, use equal to a, a agricultural society where men basically did the work and women can sit down to a uh, industrial society where men still had to do the work to a society where now we're technological and men aren't even relevant anymore. How do you think those women will treat those men who have a lower social status in that society? Like they're not good enough. Even worse, because, see, they still needed them during the agricultural society. They right. still needed them during the industrial society, but they don't need them in the technological society. Now, where are we right now in Western world? We're techn technological. Is it starting to make sense to you now? Oh, it, it's always made sense to me. Yeah, cool, man, cool. Malika, bro, I need you in here, man. What are your thoughts on this thing, man? On point, like a sniper as usual, brother. I like this approach, man. Very, very um, good with uh, biology and social hierarchy. Very cool. What do you think about that concept? Because, see, the most controversial thing is something we all know. There's a reason why women are attracted, like, especially in the black community. What do the sisters always say that they want? I want me a black man with a bald head. Don't they say that? Right? Right? They want a dark skin. But who, who, oh, yes. it, it, man, you know, if you don't cut it out, you don't <laughs> cut that out. Who do you think they'll think is more masculine? Edris Elba or Prince, the former artist Prince? Oh, off the, off the bat, Edris Elba. Because you, you just hit the nail right on the head. First yeah. of all, it has, you're talking about the biological imperative. Right. Women pick and choose. Let, let's just say all female species, mm -hmm. animals, um, standing mammals on two feet and mammals on four legs always give up the goods for the most masculine and most powerful mm -hmm. male because it's for them to find the best to have the seed for their offspring. Mm -hmm. It is. Not saying that, you know, Prince wasn't going to have good, strong children. 
-hmm. But you know, you're going to think like, you know, if if you had to put it out there, it says, who do you want to have kids by? Prince? Yeah. Or Idris Elba? And then you know, a lot of women going to say, I like Prince, but they say, no, if it was to have a bunch of warriors and hunter gatherers, a woman going to say, oh, hands down, Idris Elba, because they're going to look at the genetics mm -hmm. and they're going to look at how the way it is. Now, I'm going to ask you a very controversial question, brother, because people are not going to like this. All right. Mm -hmm. There's this colorism thing, right? And it, usually it's a woman thing, you know, because mm -hmm. that's where they are. And this is actually color, colorism, too, in comparing Prince to Edris Elba. But ask to women, will you often say stuff like the reason that black men and men of color choose white women is because of the standards set by the system of white supremacy, racism, and their ideals of beauty? Have you heard that theory before? Yes. They say that the reason that we don't have more black women or dark skinned women, whatever, uh, as beauty queens is because of the system of white supremacy racism. That's what they say, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if we look at the features of dark, we see darker skin. And if we're talking about African women, because of course they're dark skinned women with long flowing hair and all that. But if we're talking about sub-Saharan African women, we're talking about broader noses. The phenotype. Phenotype, coarser hair, mm -hmm. broader noses, and darker skin. Mm -hmm. Right? And based on what we know about neoteny, well, let's say, how does a child, how does a child come out? Child, I pointed out, brought some pictures up. Children come out with what? That soft, fine hair, right? Mm-hmm. Oftentimes, even if you're, both of your parents are dark skinned and you're going to be set to be dark skinned, you're going to come out light skinned when you come out right out your mama, right? Mm -hmm. So what's more attractive it, to, the human, to the human eye? Wh who's more appealing? Who, who, looks, who, who brings about the, the, uh, more of the, um, the feelings of, 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 of who's more childlike? Who's more attractive? That's kind of where I'm going. I don't think it has anything to do with white supremacy racism. I think since the onset of time or since the onset of society, we've just been attracted to this. And I think it's something that comes from our body. I think this is how we develop. Because I showed you the ugly babies and I showed you the pretty babies. <laughs> Who are you more likely to pick up? Oh, definitely. Because that's what you're drawn to. That's, so who, um, that, that's a, I, I, I see where you're getting at because we're, that's natural, that, you know it is because you're drawn to what is, what you like, what it, what appeals to you. Yeah, and, and what and what made those babies ugly? See, that's the thing. You got to why those babies ugly, huh? Because their noses were big, mm -hmm. right? Because they 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 had wrinkles. Because they were. This is why. This is why they're ugly. You see what I'm saying? Because we we as human beings pass judgment on what's pretty and what's ugly, right? Yeah. To our own specifications. Well, right? you know what? Can I say something? You just said of something you about can. the. I need to hear it. Yeah, go ahead. Man. You just said something about the um, tall, dark, and handsome. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, as brothers, you know, and men, we're we're attracted to hips, big buttocks, mm -hmm. and big breasts. That's that's natural symmetry, man. That's that's human. You know, we all like that. You know. You got guys that are breastmen, guys that are buttmen, guys that are legmen. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, we've been having this talk on your show and also within the manosphere that, you know, and Kevin Samuels talks about it. No man really wants an obese woman. Mm -hmm. well, I, I want to I want to I want to I want to ask you a question about that because I want to dig into that a little deeper. You remember mm -hmm. that part in uh, the video where he says something like, early on in the development of man. Well, what were the standards of beauty? Mm -hmm. The standards of beauty was what? Who's the most physically fit woman? Exactly. So a woman who was well proportioned, who looked like she could carry weight, who looked like who she could bury children, she was strong, she was the most attractive. But in a society where you got agri agricultural, in a society where uh, you got money to spare and resources to spare, the question now is not only who's the most physically attractive and who looks like they can bear children and hunt and gather or gather, 
Now it's also who's the prettiest. Exactly. And this is what, and so this is what he was saying. Now you say you have these people traveling around the world looking for people who just these unreal expectations of beauty because we have ample resources. That was the whole point of that. So my question to you is, man, which one of these babies is ugly and why? Oh, all of them was ugly. <laughs> and so why are these babies pretty? Oh, because facial symmetry, everything, you know. Now, when we you talk about eyes. facial symmetry, you're talking about like how the face is. Yes. But I'm talking about features. Features. Eyes, just, nose, cheeks. Um, uh -huh. The uh, soft features. You uh -huh. know, when we when we talk about um, women, very feminine features. We talk about soft features. When we look at children, that very innocent, childlike, soft features. You know, they don't have hard features. They don't have. They don't look tired and run down. They don't look like you know. They've been through hell and back. You know. Mm -hmm. You know, yep. men. We're drawn to women that have those soft, attractive features. We're not drawn to women that have those hard features like how the way you're saying when um a lot of women today have hard features because of their because of their attitudes and because of their taking on more than they need to be you know they want to be anything and everything but you know they look run down you know you got a woman that's 32 but she looks like she's 54. Mm -hmm. Um, also because of diet, also because of all the chemicals you put in your hair because of the perm, because of the weave, the wigs, also because of bad diet, also mm -hmm. because of possibly of all the lovers you have because that drains on your body, also mm -hmm. possibly because of the multiple children you might have had from multiple men, and also because of just not exercising right. Right. And also just having um bad um a bad constitution. Now I'm gonna show you some more pictures because I, I want to bring this home. I would say that this this woman is pretty. Let's look at her. Mm -hmm. So it's not just dark skin, is just one aspect of it. She's a beautiful woman. Yeah. And, and most of us in here jump on it because look at her, look at her face, soft features, mm -hmm. you know, you know, she has soft hair. She has right. a sub hair, African nose, but think about it. It's symmetry. Look at everything from her shoulders, yeah. her collar. Now look at everything. this. Now look at this woman. These are Aboriginal women. Nah, they are. Right. Why? Though? Because they still have the same dark skin. It's the features. Mm -hmm. You see? Now, if these were, if this, if there was a woman that looked like this, you'd be like uh, a man that looked like. You'd be like, okay, he just is still masculine. Yeah, yeah, it's still masculine. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's still masculine. You see what I'm saying? And so what I think is happening is, and I think colorism, uh, first of all, it, it affects social status amongst women mm -hmm. especially. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's part of the biological imperative. You see, I think it's one of those reasons that we choose mates and we choose to make some have a higher status than others. And mm -hmm. I think women understand that, but they don't like it. And so in a modern society where we live and knowing that it's part of their biological imperative to be part or in the center of the social cir circle because of protection and whatnot. And because of, you know, their, like I said, their biological imperatives. Um, I, oh, where, Landon, where, what happened to you, Landon? Man, Landon uh, Brickenridge, unmute yourself. I was about to bring you on. So, Malika, what else do you have to say? And then we're going to go to Landon. I want to hear more about what you guys have to say about this conversation. And look, if you appreciate the conversation, please contribute to the Super Chat, the Cash App, and the PayPal. I don't think there's ever been this conversation in the Black Manosphere uh, to date. And I want to have it. Uh, Landon, what do you, Malika, what else you want to say? And then, because uh, otherwise, if you guys don't, I'm going to have to put the members only chat on. All right. I don't want to do that. I want everybody involved. So, Please contribute to the super chat, the cash app, and the PayPal. Malika, what else you got to say? And then we're going to go to Landon. Or let, let's just go to Landon real quick because he's been waiting. Okay, Malika. Mm -hmm. Landon, what are your thoughts on this conversation? Yo, can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you great. Yeah, so one of the things that I've been noticing is like the – you had like the herd mentality, right? The, all the elephants. Things were in the middle, like the strongest ones were on the outside, right? Uh -huh. Um, so like one of the correlations like I see like amongst people is like when 
you get the uh, the weight gain thing. Like uh, there was some correlation between like the the lady who was killed by police, um, and like the the weight gain thing. So like it's a defense mechanism wow. for for women whenever they're like in stressful situations. So they put on a bunch of weight so they seem less attractive or they're or they're uh more they're a little bit more well, dangerous uh, to approach. If that makes sense. Can can I can I help you out with that? Can I help you out with that? What happens? Uh, weight gain, the putting on of more padding, like on a football team. What are you doing when you put more padding on your body before you get ready to go play football? What, what's the point of that? Yeah, I mean, you got to protect yourself, right? You're, you're preparing Protection. for impact. Protection. Putting weight on your midsection and your body, it protects your organs. It protects your vital organs. This is a natural adaptation. Uh, to to an, that's why the bigger an animal. What do what do animals do? When they get ready to men out. They get ready to fight. Do they look? Does a big six hundred pound grizzly bear look vulnerable to you, or does he look like a menace? <laughs> Not that you've ever seen a six hundred pound all. grizzly bear. But but what I'm saying is it it's, like it's a the biological adaptation that comes about when an organism see, see, uh, understands and comes to the realization that it needs more protection. It's a defense mechanism. So when you saw that young lady, uh, I think her name was Makayla Davis. When you saw her, you heard first you heard old teenage girl shot by the police. And then when you saw her, what did you see? Uh, I saw a blade in her hand and I saw another woman in fear like this. All right. What did you see as far as the human being that you saw with the knife? What is she describe her for me? Large Mike? person. You saw a large person. And will you oh, uh, do you normally know. associate large people with needing protection? No, not at all. I mean, it, it was definitely someone who looks like they were they were able to attack, they were able to hold their own ground. I mean, she was like clearly knocking out two people or you know, handling one over here and then going back for this next person. So she was in control of the situation. So you know, based on your opinion. Right. So based on your opinion. In this society that we live in, in this social structure, in this, in this clan that we live in, it, does it? Who would you? Do you think that she needed you to come rescue her? No, no. She By had contrast, it. had she been the same height but 110 pounds, small, slender. I mean, name, name some slender model or something like that. Who's some small and uh, slender? Like you know, uh, Jada name Smith. Smith. Jada Pink. Well, we ain't gonna say Jada Pink is fit. I ain't nobody trying to help her, man. <laughs> uh, but uh, bottom Nia, Long. Nia Long. Let's say if it was if she had a body style of Nia Long, you may be more inclined to say, "Well, she's vulnerable. She needs my help." You understand? And that's part of your right. biological assessment. That's how you, as a hunter gatherer, as this is this is the mindset you have. You assume. That a person who is smaller and, and 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 thinner needs help. You don't assume that a woman who is as big as you or heavier needs help. This is the this is the assessment that your brain made. Isn't that interesting? This is, in other words, man. What I'm saying is, this is where your prejudice came from. You see. Now let's add a color code to that. Let's say, let's say it was a small, thin, little white girl. Right? Mm -hmm. Small, thin, little white girl as opposed to a large, heavy set black girl. Who do you think society would dictate is more vulnerable? Yeah, the, the small white girl for sure. Why? Throw out your emotions. She's throw, got throw away your emotions. Get your emotions out of here. Yes. We're not going to have an emotional <laughs> conversation. Uh, Let's base it on science. Why got, is it? What does what does that white skin signify? Uh, I guess uh, purity. Um, her size. No. Indicates throw the emotionalism the out of here. Throw the what? But see, you would have to dig deeper. Why is it signify purity? Who are the most purest human beings on the planet? No sin. Hmm. Uh, I can tell you that. Yes, you can. <laughs> Come on, bro. I've been told to you since uh, you've been born, man. 
Who is who is the most who are the most innocent pure creatures on the planet? Uh, who are the most um, innocent pure uh, human beings on the planet? Uh, I guess we, we would say white folks. Yeah, you go. No, <laughs> no, I said people. People, black people, then. No, get your emotions out of it. I'm gonna give yeah, you a hint. I'm really not sure. It's on the screen right there. Hmm. Babies, man, babies. Okay, yeah, yeah. Babies have no sin. Haven't we been? Hadn't that been in trick? Baby has no. Surely it couldn't have been the child's fault. Surely if a teenager right. was shot, it couldn't have been the child's fault. Then we saw the teenager. Surely if something happened, it couldn't have been the baby's fault because babies are innocent. Babies mm -hmm. are pure. So do you see and, and how do babies come out looking even if they're black babies? When they come fresh out of their mind, how do they, huh? Innocent. No, brother. Listen, how do, what do babies look like as soon as they come out of their moms? Even if it's a dark skinned baby, it comes out white looking. You understand what I'm saying? So what I'm trying to tell you, brother, is that some of this that we're dealing with is because of our socialization over the past 150,000 years, 100,000 years. You see, some of the things we associate with uh, as far as purity is because uh, 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 some of the some of some of our natural biasness, you see what I'm saying towards or in favor of women and white people and our biasness in favor toward of dark skinned men being more masculine is because of how we uh, were uh, how we developed. You understand you associate with masculinity with what big, strong, dark nose. That's why women say they want a man who's tall, dark and handsome. That's why they would say, if, if given the choice between Edris Elba and Prince, i.e., who's the most masculine, they're going to choose uh, Edris Elba 99% of the time. You see what I'm saying? The reason that we have colorism is because men choose lighter skinned women with the softer features that look younger to them. This is how we were what? This is part of our evolution. It angers people. I get it. But if you really look at it and you take your emotions out of it, you can understand it. You, and, and why is it that it angers? Why do women even care what another woman looks like or why she can get a better, higher status man than, than, than she can? Because status matters. Because status, in, status ensures your physical security. It ensures your resource level. You get to sit at the front of the pack. So when the wolves come, and when the lions come, you're at the front. You got the best food, you got the best access to, to, to sexual sex partners, and you got the safety. Because remember, for a hundred for the vast majority of the time, what we lived in these packs, we lived in these 150 people groups. Are you understanding now, Landon? Yeah, yeah. It's hard, huh? I hate it for you, man. <laughs> You know, I hate it for you, but these yeah, are some a good conversation. Yeah. Right. And so when you understand this, then everything changes because, see, then you can adapt. See, all that pickup artist stuff that they was teaching like eight, nine years ago. All that was was the tip of the iceberg. They were saying, pretend like you're more masculine. Uh, pretend like you're confident by saying something flippant to the woman like you don't need her. You're showing her you have a higher social status than she does. Uh, uh, Landon, um, ladies, put makeup on, get a big bag, show people that you have a higher social status so you can attract men with higher social status and women can treat you differently because they'll perceive you as having being younger and having a higher social status. When you begin to understand biology, see at a certain level, man, wh whatever PhD you have, whether it's in organic chemistry, science, it all, sociology, it all merges at the top. It's the reason why African griots, they were forced to study for 40, 50 years and to learn everything there was to learn. Because what they realize is at the top, all knowledge merges. 
whether it's astronomy or mathematics, it all comes together at the top. And so by studying biology and mastering it, you then begin to understand sociology and psychology. And so what I'm trying to do is I'm giving you guys a top down lesson of what most of the people who are in those think tanks already know. See, this is that information that the that the masses is not ready for, which is why y'all are looking at me with these blank stares. <laughs> and some of you guys are gonna say, this dude is crazy, but it's not uncommon knowledge. Nothing I've shown you is not known. It's all there for you, just haven't put it together. You understand what I'm saying? And by even by me introducing this to you guys, you guys are like, this is why they say they're not ready for it. Why even teach them? They're not even ready. They would never teach you this. They, why, why even bother teaching you this? They're just not ready. And so what do they do? They give you the Bible and say, yeah, y'all, y'all, here's your Bible. Y'all go ahead and read that. Y'all not ready for this. You understand what I'm saying, brother? It's a beautiful thing. I'm, I'm happy for you guys. I'm enjoying this myself. But anyway, look, we're going to go to J.J. Diesel Monk, and then we're going to go to Tyree. What's up, J.J. Cowboy, J.J. Diesel Cowboy Monk? How do you like this conversation, man? I hope it's uncomfortable for you. Hope everybody's uncomfortable. Go ahead. What are your thoughts? <laughs> it's, it's a learning experience. How's it going, Dennis? And chat panel, how y'all doing? We're good. But what, what, what do you me? want to add to the conversation? Go ahead. Um, looks is in the eye of the beholder, from what I was taught, and it's according to what you find attractive. Um, See, it shouldn't be that, based on that, what society. The reason you, the reason people say that is because they're uncomfortable telling the truth about what they're actually attracted to, because it sounds bad. That's an uncomfortable response because you're in a, an emotional quagmire. You like what you like. Now you can you can make yourself like something you don't like. You can tell yourself you like something you don't like. Whatever you like, you like. It. But the bottom line is. When we poll the millions of people on this planet, what we find is, and I, and I guess you're assuming we're talking about lighter skin, longer hair, those sort of, especially in women, they find those features to be more feminine, right? Is that true? Yeah, I would yeah. say so. Yeah. So how can we blame white supremacy racism if basically since the beginning of time when given the choice, Men choose more feminine looking women and they associate feminine looking with lighter skin, even if they were African, lighter skin, smaller features, finer hair. I like longer hair myself. Uh, yeah. To me, it's not attractive for a woman to cut her hair off. Not, a woman is not supposed to cut her hair off anyway. Right. Well, we don't want to, you know, I, I know that's a biblical verse, but we want to stick with the science. I want to kind of just focus on the science. Do you understand? Like Neotni says, what women who are women who are younger looking are more attractive. We can all agree on that, right? Right. And right. the reason, and, and and women will go a long way to make themselves more attractive. What do they do? Makeup, right? They got a multi-billion-dollar okay. industry for um, makeup alone, a trillion-dollar. You see what I'm saying? Because anytime human mm -hmm. beings are driven, but well, go ahead, brother. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just iterating, uh, just just adding to the list of things that you say they do to make themselves more attractive. Yeah, the makeup, the weave, uh, the boob implants, the butt implants. Not just oh, they don't get weave that looks like the hair that comes out of their head. They get weave that looks what long and straight and soft. Right. Why is that? That's because they are uh, going by what society is telling them is attractive. No, I think. Brother, see you see, here's the problem that we're gonna have now. Some of you all, I get it. It's I mean, uncomfortable it, to say this. I get it. And I love you guys for it. I love you for the struggle that we see. It's not because society says it. Who is society composed of? JJ Diesel Cowboy Monk. Um people. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Who is society composed of? People. It's, it's just a large, People. yeah. And so it's when you say society, society, we say society like it's this fictitious thing, this alien or something. No, people dictate what they determine to be attractive. And people right. have dictated that as far as women, 
lighter skin, longer hair, smaller features is more attractive. And as far as men, what do they say? Tall, dark, and handsome. Ain't that something? Yeah. Because it appears to be more masculine. More likely to be able to deal with the environment. More able to control the environment. You, you, you understand? Right. It's a beautiful thing. Anyway, uh, hold on a minute. We're going to go to Tyree. Man, Tyree, you've been waiting patiently, riding down the street with your shades on, smiling big. You're doing it. I see you out there, man. What are your thoughts on this conversation? Oh, man, we can't hear you, brother. You got to unmute yourself or whatever. Oh, man. All right, C go out and come back in. We're going to go back to Malika. Go out and come back in. Uh, Malika, man, what 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 else you got to add on to this thing, man? When you said something about women understanding what the standard is, right? Mm -hmm. Especially the standard of beauty in order to get that protection provision and also be able to procreate. One thing that we're realizing now, especially in our society now with this generation, you're dealing with a lot of women that don't want to do the work. Well, OK, well, let me let me I want to start off by saying this. Now they're free to do what the hell they want to do. They don't have to fake anymore. See, the mask is off because, see, we're in the technological society where they don't need us anymore. So gotcha. they are. What did my grandma say? They showing you they complete, whole and entire backside. <laughs> backside. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So you're really seeing female nature unleashed. They're just showing you who they are. This is who we are when we don't need you anymore. You see gotcha. what I'm saying? And this is gotcha. this is the this is the miracle of technology. It, it, and it's I'm sure it was like this, right? Back in that time period when we were uh uh hunters and gatherers, they had they stuff. Well, we don't need y'all though. You see what I'm saying? But even then we kind of still needed each other because they needed to gather, we needed to we they needed the protein, we needed the grains and and whatnot. So right now, I think at this point, or I'll say at this point time and mind you we've only been in this for the past 30 40 years can you mm -hmm. imagine what it's going to be like in 400 years when time technology increases and they really don't need us anymore huh yeah. they might eliminate us man they might get rid of us. yeah I, I, but but yeah i don't but, know about but, all that though i know you yeah well you know but the bottom line is you understand you you see how it, you, you understand why it was important to do that long presentation yeah. in the beginning but go ahead, man. Go ahead. The floor is no, yours, and we're going to go to Tyree. Tyree, are you there? Can you hear no, me, go Tyree? To brother, go to Brother Tyree. I just wanted to make that small point, man. He, no problem. He, Tyree, can you hear me? Yeah, man. I can hear you. Can you hear me? All right, man. Go ahead, man. Y'all contribute to the Super Chat, the Cash App, and the PayPal. What are your thoughts on this subject, Tyree? Uh, so I never really thought about it like why, why I wouldn't be attracted to a woman that's like, my grandmother's age or anything like never really gave it much thought but a woman like i don't want to see a woman with a bunch of wrinkles on her and i don't i don't want to see like uh like missing teeth and things like that and a big nose but i'm I, i'm thinking more like why is that but well, why is that i mean i guess technologies allow me to be able to discriminate against the type of woman that i that i see that i want to uh, reproduce with or can take care of my children. So what, what is what is what is wrinkles and all that signify to you? That she's that the that the devil's the rough on. All right, what would you call a woman with a bunch of wrinkles or something like that? An older, an older woman. An older yeah, woman. but what's a what's a quicker word that starts with you and rhymes with mugly? <laughs> ugly. Ugly. You would call her ugly, bro. It, 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 yeah, yeah. This is the judgment. And ugly is a biological protective organism that keeps us from breeding with women that we shouldn't be breeding with. You see what I'm saying? Now, yeah. Malika brought up something related to, to uh, uh, symmetry as to the face. Oftentimes, when one part of your head was up or down or something like you had one eye, go, it, it, may, it, it, it signified that you had some sort of illness or some disformity, which yeah. then would, you know, jeopardize uh, the life yeah offspring will survive you see what i'm saying so that's why that's also considered something but look look at these pictures tyree look at these pictures see that there's a reason why i google ugly baby and these children pop up 
Yeah. You see them? There's a reason why I Google pretty baby and these pictures pop up. It's because of their features. It's because, I mean, these are kids. If you take the face off one of them, they'd be just little kids. They're still babies, but some are ugly and some are not. Uh, Which yeah. one are you more likely to go pick up? Which one of these are you more likely to go pick up this this handsome young gentleman right here? <laughs> or are you more likely to go pick up this cute little babies up in here? You see what I'm saying? Absolutely. Yes, yes. Right. And so likewise, when you talk about women, right? Uh, when you when you talk about women, there's a more likelihood that you're gonna go for a pretty woman who has features that are with no wrinkles on them and and, and it, it it's just man. It's uncomfortable, and trust me, I've been I've been debating with myself on whether or not I wanted to have this conversation because I know it's going to be some blowback because people don't want to hear it. You know, they're going to fight about it. But there's a reason why we are in the situation that we're in. You know, women are free. They can do what they want to do. They can pick and choose who they want to pick. Men are now free. You can pick and choose. You're not just stuck with the woman next to you because ain't nobody else for 100 miles. you picking and choosing the best that you can get. You see what I'm saying? And, uh, yeah. you know, it, it's an interesting combination. But uh, who else? Let's see. We got one more person in here. Uh, Rod P. Uh, uh, let me. Rod P, unmute yourself. What's up? Talk to me. Yes, sir. Can you hear me clear? I can hear you fine. I'm happy you're here. What are your thoughts yes, on this, this, this touchy conversation? I wish some of y'all would say something I don't want to say. But go ahead. Go uh, ahead, so Uncle, Uncle D, uh, like you. I have a biology background, so Great. a lot, a lot of this, um, this uh, what's attractive and what's unattractive, yeah. that boils down to fertility and passing the strongest genes along. Like some of the, uh, some of the traits that we call ugly, Uncle D, just naturally, like the mm -hmm. wrinkles and stuff like that, that does not signify fertility. For example, uh, if you had a woman with short hair, well, let's say it like this: if she has long hair, what does that signify? That signifies she's that she's protein and she's well taken care of. That's what right. She it, it it signifies that she's been healthy for at least a few years. She's mm -hmm. safe to reproduce with. If she has curves and she's you know she's kind of you know like what we what we say thick, not fat, but thick. What is that going to say? Oh, she has enough nutrients stored up to conceive and last throughout a pregnancy. Right. It's a lot of this stuff that we signify with sex appeal and beauty, hmm. you know, it's it's biological. And it's so a tell, shame. Tell that, them why men who are perceived as more masculine, men who are perceived to muscular men with big strong muscles and that 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 tall why do women why are women attracted to men who are tall, dark, and handsome? Why it, would they it's prefer a, a Edris Elba over a prince? It's two things, Uncle D. The two P's providing and protecting if he has mm -hmm. if he's if he's strong or if he has that physique hey this guy can protect me and this guy's a go-getter and he has good strong genes and uh, do you, which one? Do, do, huh? when you think of protection do you think a baby can protect you definitely not all right and, and so what what do babies look like even when they're dark skinned when they come out man they they white they white they're white they're white Oh yeah. So, so let me show you some pictures, right? Uh huh. Who looked more like a baby? This dude, or uh, <laughs> this dude right here? Let me get. Let me hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. I got. Uh huh. All right. This brother, y'all know Edris Elba. Who looks? Who looks more masculine? This cat or this cat right here? Man, it drees all day. All right. Who looks more feminine? This dude or this dude? Man, Prince. All day. Okay. All right. So when we put on pictures of and why does he look more feminine? Look at his hair. Man, you hey, just just nature. Just, uh, uh, I know, but look uh, at his hair. Look at his eye, because we got it, we can't, we're not emotional with it, you know. Right, look at his right. hair. Look at his eyes. He looked like yeah, a baby. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. He, they look. He looks like he can't protect anybody. He looks more feminine. So yeah. I say all that to say, if, if if you put some pictures 
of some of some women up there who are who are fair skinned. They could be African, women, but if they're fair skinned with longer hair, you're gonna see them as more uh, as more feminine. It's not yeah. so much that colorism is something that came about because of white supremacy racism. It's more so it's part of how we evolve. You yeah. see what I mean? This is so we're fighting against our biological imperative. No different than women, even if they're white women, they could be racist to the bone. They still yeah. want them a tall, dark, muscular black man. That's why you have all these white folks that got what they call a, a, a N word in the woodpile back in the day. Yeah. You see yeah. what I'm saying? It's a biological yeah. imperative. It overrides logic. And when presented with the opportunity to, 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 to not have the restrictions that we used to have on us through the development of society, people show who they really are and what they're really attracted to. And this exactly. is what we are now. This is why you have black men who say, you know what, and I hate to say it, you know, we, 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 we love our sisters, but who wants to sleep with their sister? You see what I'm saying? But then, exactly. but then also presented with the opportunity as soon as we got out of what? As soon as we got out of that apartheid system that we call Jim Crow, the first thing we started doing was what? Traveling around and GIs went over to, to, to yep. Europe. They came back with them Asian women and French women. Yep. Now brothers are beginning to marry and out. And no matter what you impose on them as far as uh, racial uh, loyalty and trying to scare them, they're still getting over there. Now, women yep. are black women and most women. And people will tell you, even though black men are low on the totem pole, we are mm -hmm. still able to pull women because at the end of the day, their biological imperative says they want a man who is masculine. And the, and the epitome of masculinity is what? A tall, dark, handsome man. Who fits exactly. that better than especially our dark skinned brothers, especially our sub Saharan, because you've got the broad nose, you, you, you're looking like yeah. a, a man. You understand exactly. what I'm saying? Yes, and so it, it's, it's impossible to get around that. Sisters, because they are not the epitome of femininity, and I'm not saying they're not beautiful, I'm saying there's a reason why the world puts those women who have whiter skin or lighter skin and softer features at the top of the pretty scale. It's, mm -hmm. it's not something that the white man did, it's something that's been around. You, you understand? It, it just yes, is. What it, even look at some of the pictures of some of the, 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 the queens and princesses and whatnot from way back when it was just Africans on the Look at their sculptures. The men had these broad noses and the queens had these little small features. Even they was jet black, but they still had exactly those right. features. You see what I mean? Yep. So, it, so it's just something to think about. And so I think if we begin to look at it from a biological standpoint, as opposed to we don't have any control over because the white man did it to us, then we can better address the situation. But as long as you say, oh, it's, it's, this is the white, you you looking at the wrong source for, for the, for, if you want to call it an ailment, you're looking at the wrong source for the ailment. This is our biological imperative. It, it, this is why, you know? But I don't know. What else you think, Rod? And, and then we're going to go to, uh, who, who else we missed? Go ahead, Rod. I, I, had a, I had a question, Uncle D. I was going to ask you as a, as an older, more seasoned man. Yeah. What, I, I'm seeing a trend of, women, our sisters, our lovely ladies, picking guys with those feminine features. Mm -hmm. And that's a trend that I did not see. My mom and dad are in that baby boomer generation. I uh, did not see those women pick guys like that. A lot right, of let our me, sisters now. A, huh? I got an answer for you, and I posted this up the other day, but let me uh, troll check. Super Tony, what's up, man? Unmute yourself. What you, what you up to? How's it going, sir? Uh, pleasure to be on. Can you hear me? All right, cool. Yeah, I just wanted to troll check you real quick. So let me put you on. We're going to go to you next. So Rod P, uh -huh. you ever heard that old saying, opposites attract? Oh, yeah. So if you got a masculine woman, do you think she wants a masculine man? No, they're going to end up, no. So a masculine woman is, for the most part, going to be attra attracted to a feminine man or an emasculated yeah. man. Yeah. Emasculated. You see what I'm saying? Because yeah, when you I got see. two bulls in the house, you got a strong woman and a strong man, ain't nothing gonna happen in there but a fight. They're gonna tear the you house up, yeah. And yeah. it's interesting how society evolves to give you what you're asking for. See, yeah. we had we had a society where 
it was it become apropos to have a bunch of masculine black men around. So what do we do? We purposely, our mothers, they emasculated us for the purposes of survival. They yeah. they told, yeah, you don't need to be around the daddy. I gotta keep you away from that daddy because that daddy might man you up, and the next thing you know, uh -huh. you're down there fighting with white folks and you get lynched. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? I work, I work in education. I see a lot of that. Yeah. I see a lot of it. It, it, it it's a biological. Uh, like I said earlier, at the top, the psychology, the sociology, the biology, the biology, everything begins to merge. This is what's happening. You see, this is this yeah. is what's happening. We live in a society where those who are of lighter skin have a higher social status. So now yeah. we have what? We have people who are gravitating to that. We we have angry. A lot of sisters are angry because they don't have the options that black men have. You are the most masculine man especially the darker skin men, you are the most masculine man on the planet. So you're always going to have an opportunity to be with women. But they are not the most feminine women on the planet per per society's structure. You know? Right, uh, right. So it's just interesting, man. Uh, you know, I, uh, I just think it's interesting, man. But anyway, uh, we got Super Tony in here. If you guys appreciate this conversation, contribute to the Super Chat, the Cash App, and the PayPal. Uh, Super Tony, what you got to say to this thing? Um, am I hurt, sir? So make sure I'm hurt before I start. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I uh, um, just want to touch on a few things real quick. Um, we hear that that same social par uh, uh, that phrase about beauty is an eye of the beholder. Um, in a sense, I, I would say it's kind of um, it's kind of both. That attraction is subjective and a bit um. um uh, a bit objective and, and the sense of where um someone that had let's say a nerdy chick for example you might consider her attractive because let's say you see a lot of bad bees are not loyal so you know what i'm trying to say so in that aspect you you you're attracted to her but like um so basically what you're, so you're attracted to the bad bees but you're settling for the nerdy girl. That sounds what that. That's, yes, yes. That, there, yeah. And so it's 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 a, it's a vote. But there is a standard of beauty, mm -hmm. and people don't want to accept that. There is a, a certain standard because, like, let's let's. Um, and I, I was and, hoping you touch and, on this. What is that standard of beauty worldwide? Who, who do most men around the world um, say is beautiful? Women, as far as women. Anything that's anything that reflects gentleness. And and, and, and what then, is that? You know, give me, it give it to me in terms. Give it to me in in, in physical features. Um, anything that reflects a gentle feature, like um, proportion of eyes, a uh, uh, smooth skin, um, even skin. Um, oh, you you beating around yeah, the bush. Uh, oh, not anything that's not too broad, like anything broad that doesn't features, look like, like he's anything that doesn't look tall, dark, and handsome. With a broad Anything nose. that don't look now nah, masculine, I'm put like that. Anything right. that don't look masculine, put I'm, uh, yeah. that's just basically like yeah, it, the, the the opposite expression of a masculine figure. So and if, if 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 a dark skinned black man with a broad nose, big muscles, is the epitome of masculinity, then what is the epitome of femininity? Um. You scared to say it? Man, that's a good question. That's a good question. You know, uh, it's it's going to be the exact opposite of that, which is the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is the same type of woman that the whole world has chosen. You see what I mean? Yeah. I, I, you know, it's funny. Before I even go over any further, a little further, I, I was hoping yeah. you would touch on this. It w and you, you, you ever watch bodybuilding? And you yeah. notice even the most, like, uh, the blonde dudes, they I always. They paint themselves, and the reason I noticed because um, years ago, in my early twenties, I was going to do bodybuilding, and even as a brown-skinned guy, they were going to make me darker to just pose. Because darker and symbolizes that, more more masculinity. Yes. And so just like yes. lighter symbolizes more femininity, which is why light-skinned brothers, we can never have either. We will never be. The, the epitome of masculinity, no matter how hard we try. You know, that's why the whole light skin, dark skin thing, that you can have some masculine brothers, but you're going to have your Muhammad Ali's and whatnot. But pound for pound, the dark skinned black men who, who have the, the features, they're going to be being more masculine, period. 
You understand what I'm saying? And so the yeah, opposite yeah. of that, so if you got a, a dark skinned woman who's buffed up and like the young girl who's y'all not like she looks masculine and given the choice when you're able to do what you want to do and you're not bound by these societal restrictions that we have and you can go towards your evolution you're going to pick women who you deem more feminine and uh it's just yeah, all yeah. I, I find it interesting i, want, I want to touch on that to be a little more not to sound oh, insensitive you know what I'm, I'm about to run a commercial because ain't nobody contributed to the super chat We'll be right back. Y'all contribute to the Super Chat, the Cash App, and the Facebook. Hey, what's up, everybody? If you appreciate the format and you appreciate what we're doing here, then make sure you contribute to the Cash App. Make sure you contribute to the PayPal. Make sure you donate to the Super Chat. It's only you and your contributions that keep this thing going. Thanks. All right. What else you got to say, bro? Um, yeah, um... Give an example about how the girl, uh, um, the girl was fighting when the cops came. Um, yeah, we we don't want to dwell on that. I'm just saying nobody saw yeah, her. Yeah, yeah. Super, nobody saw her as super feminine at that time because of her weight and her size, and you know we didn't see her as super feminine. And that that's why yeah. people haven't run to her aid and, so, uh, and given her the benefit of the doubt because she there's, didn't a, look there's like, a conflict. Right. There's a, a a a natural biological conflict between our perspe uh, per perspective yeah. and um um this the circumstance. So yeah, yeah, and, there's, and, there's, yeah. There's, and 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 likewise, and I and the young brother Trayvon Martin, because he was a black boy, right? He looked masculine, yep. and nobody and we couldn't perceive him. Well, not well, we're not taught to perceive him as vulnerable because even in this society, we perpetuate young black men as thugs, but why is it so easy to label him a thug? You see what I mean? As horrible as some of these Asian gangs are in Japan, especially <laughs> Japan, we never, they do some horrible things, but we never deem them as thugs. Why is that? Because we look at little Japanese dude and they got the little toes and the little short self with the little slick hair. We're, we're not, we're not, not threatened. Afraid. I mean, yeah, just, you know. I'm uh, not afraid of you, sir. Yeah, I don't care. based on the visual, yeah, based on the visual, when we, yeah, we're, we don't, we're not you know, I'm not saying that someone can't, you know, kick you in the face, but when you look visually, you're just, we don't feel threatened. And yeah, yeah, yeah there, there is, there's something going on there. There's something. Yeah. Well, hey, man, I think I, I did it today. I hope you guys check this out. But either way, man, this is Uncle D, man. I got to get out of here. Guys, I love you. It's Uncle D and I'm out.